Hello, hello! Welcome back to Loki's Librarian. I am the librarian Katrina. If you are new here, welcome. This is where I am reading through the enormous library of books you see behind me, and then I give you a quick synopsis and I tell you what I think about them. So if you like books, just aren't sure what to read next, hit that subscribe button, like and share my videos, let me know what you think in the comments. Now, it is the last Sunday of the month, which means it is time for another president. And since last month was Martin Van Buren, that means this month we are on to president number nine, William Henry Harrison, which makes this week's book of the week, Mr. Jefferson's Hammer, William Henry Harrison and the Origins of the American Indian Policy by Robert M. Owens. This is kind of some dark, depressing reading actually, which is among the many reasons I added booze to this a few weeks ago. I typically try to find a cocktail that is topical to the book, but when you Google Tip a Canoe, because that was that was the campaign slogan when he ran, it was Tip a Canoe and Tyler too. When you Google Tip a Canoe and Cocktail, what comes back is that Harrison was known for his eggnog. So we're going to be doing some eggnog here. Let's jump into this. The ninth president of these United States was born on February 9th, 1773 at the Harrison Family Manor in Berkeley, or excuse me, of Berkeley in Charles City County, Virginia. Okay. Oh, real quick note. Eggnog these days typically is a really heavy concoction of egg, milk, cream, sugar. The old fashioned eggnog, the sort that William Henry Harrison would drink, had an egg, sugar, and a big ass cup of booze. So he would have made his with either red wine or hard cider. I'm using hard cider today because I am actually not much of a wine drinker and I didn't want to waste a whole bottle for one cocktail. So we're doing cider and starting with our egg which you put into a mixer with ice. So, ninth president was born February 9th, 1773 in Virginia. He was the seventh child born to Benjamin Harrison V and Elizabeth Bassett Harrison. Benjamin Harrison V was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and the whole family was kind of raised with this sense of American manifest destiny. And during the revolution, while Benjamin Harrison V was fighting, the family home was ransacked by Benedict Arnold's troops when they ran through Virginia. So there's, there's quite a bit of American history there. William Henry Harrison, after the war, obviously, I mean, he was only, what, three, four, <laughs> when all this happened, um, he attended the Hampton City College from 1787 to 1790, but left without obtaining a degree due to the school kind of turned towards a Puritan revivalism during this time, and the Harrisons were Episcopalian. So Benjamin Harrison V was not going to have his son become a Puritan. That just wasn't going to happen. So he kind of bounced around a bit. He left the school, the, the Hampton Sydney College. He bounced around a bit. He spent a short time at a school in Southampton before moving to Richmond to live with his brother Benjamin IV and study medicine under Dr. Leiper. However, while he was in Richmond, he kind of started looking towards a Quaker Emancipation Society. Also, not allowed when you are the son of a Virginia planter. Yeah, abolitionism is a big no go when you're the son of a Virginia planter. So he was then pulled from Richmond and sent to Philadelphia, where he was living when he received word that his father had died on April 24th, 1791. Okay, so we add um, a teaspoon of sugar. I'm not going to be too precise. I'm going to kind of make it a heaping teaspoon. His father dies. Now, kind of obvious that medicine was not William Henry's idea, because right after his father died, he enlisted with the army, or excuse me, he uh, applied for a commission with the army. We gotta shake these together. Okay. Ooh, sugar and egg everywhere. Yikes. Which is really thick and gross looking. This is gonna take a minute. That looks like snot, so this will be fun. I mean, I like eggs. I eat eggs, you know, I have omelets for breakfast and stuff, but that just. Okay. I think that's as much as I'm gonna get out of that. Put egg on my pants, because this is not vodka. I'm not just licking raw egg off my hand. I'm just not that bold. I'll drink the raw egg when mixed with cider, but I'm not going to just lick it off my hands. Okay, anyway, view here. So August 16, 1791, he applies for a commission as an ensign in the army, which was signed by President Washington. Careful pour because I want to make sure I don't just get foam everywhere. So while the war with Britain was definitely over at this time, right? I mean, the war technically ended in 1787? 87, I think. The need for the army kind of became clear at this point. So we've got our egg, we've got our cider, and we top it off with some ground nutmeg. They would have ground it fresh. I live in the 21st century where we have ready access to um, spices, so I don't need to. Oh, look at that. 
don't know if you can see it, but the egg is kind of rising up from the bottom. Huh. I wonder if I mix it. I didn't say to mix it. I'm just going to let this sit for a minute and kind of let everything merge. He is now an ensign with the arm. Oh, okay, 1783, I guess, is when the war ends. I have a note right here. So, Britain, the war is over. Part of the peace agreement with Britain in 1783 was that Britain agreed to cede the lands between Mississippi River and the Appalachian Mountains to the United States. And while troop withdrawals were slow and absolutely a contributing factor to the War of 1812, the bigger problem were the Native American tribes who had allied with the Britain, British and were left behind with British weaponry. So now America has to find a way to work with these Native tribes. Now, eventually, the American government began to believe that while Americans would surely spread west, the natives also had a right to their lands. And so the best recourse was to buy the lands. Now, don't get too excited about this. This is not as noble as it sounds, and that will all be explained later because it's pretty bad. There's a lot of chicanery to come. Uh, Ensign Harrison was, by all reports, studious. All right, he wanted to do a good job. That's commendable. He was not quite a teetotaler, obviously. He had his eggnog recipe. And it's, you know, hard apple cider with a shot of protein, so it's, it's okay. Definitely not eggnog as you would be used to it today with all the creams and the bourbons and everything, but it's not bad. So he found himself under the direction of Brigadier General James Wilkinson, who was amoral, definitely a traitor. He was on Spain's payroll until 1807, but Wilkinson and Harrison got along. Uh, they got along well, and Harrison was kind of eager to carry out orders. So much so that when Wilkinson directed anyone caught drunk outside the walls of Fort Washington, should be given 50 lashes. And Harrison took that to mean anyone, not just soldiers. Um, and when a civilian ordnance worker was found drunk, Harrison promptly administered the prescribed punishment um, and then was promptly arrested by civilian authorities. But Wilkinson intervened, wrote to President Washington explaining the situation, and Harrison was let go. He was promoted to lieutenant, only spending one night in jail as a result of this affair. So his star kind of continues to rise, and Harrison eventually finds himself as aide-de-camp to General Wayne at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, where Harrison kind of proved his mettle as, as a soldier, if you will, riding through the thick of battle to deliver orders. Uh, now, the Battle of Fallen Timbers was between the Native Americans multiple tribes, I believe, and the Americans, okay? Following this battle, General Wayne would kind of start the process that became standard operating procedure in dealing with the native tribes. Offer them money to go away, play one tribe off against another, use those who are friendly to America to coerce those who were not. Uh, and that kind of sums up the policy, and it kind of gets worse as you read your way through the book. It's okay. It's just okay. By the mid-1790s, Harrison is still in the army. He's okay with his career, but he wants to get married. Okay, so he's 20 years old at this point. He's looking to start a family. His first interest was most likely Miss Hetty Morris, who was the daughter of one of his own benefactors, Robert Morris. However, Hetty Morris uh, apparently spurned his advances, instead marrying the younger brother of John Marshall. Harrison then turned his eyes to an Anna Sims, daughter of Judge John Cleves Sims. Judge Sims did not approve of the marriage uh, and turned down Harrison's request for his daughter's hands, probably because Sims had been one of the civilian judges on that above-mentioned case where Harrison beat a civilian ordinance officer. Sims, however, was not impressed by Harrison's ability to get out of trouble by appealing to his friends and benefactors. That, that was not impressive to Sims. So he turned down his, his request. However, Anna was in love. and in a shockingly modern movement for the late 18th century. When her father was away one day, they eloped and were married on November 25th, 1795. Ultimately, they have 10 children, nine of whom who survived to adulthood, which is pretty phenomenal for the time. Harrison stayed in the army just long enough to promote to captain in 1797 and then resigned in the spring of 1798, at which point in time he was appointed to the, the position of Secretary of the Northwest Territory. He was only 25 years old at this time, and during much of his time as secretary, he was also acting as the de facto governor of the Northwest Territory because the actual governor, Arthur St. Clair, was living in Pennsylvania. So he was, Arthur was collecting the paycheck of being the governor, but Harrison was doing the work. So then on October 3rd, 1799, Harrison was elected to be the territory's 
the Northwest Territories delegate to Congress. Now, it's an important position, but it has no real power because the territorial delegates, while they're allowed to sit in on sessions of Congress and can certainly speak their piece on the congressional floor, they're not allowed to vote. So all they can do is try to influence people who can vote to vote their way, but they're not allowed to vote themselves. Um, but it's still important. It's important to be heard. So being president in the nation's capital, which at that time was still in Philadelphia, also got Harrison noticed by President Adams, okay, who nominated Harrison for the role of governor of the newly created Indiana Territory on May 12, 1800, which nomination was confirmed the next day by Congress. So he impressed quite a few people while he was there. Now, the Northwest, the, excuse me, the Indiana Territory, which was created, was comprised basically of modern-day Illinois, Indiana, excuse me, the Northwest Territory was Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio. Essentially, the Indiana Territory was Illinois, Indiana, and the western part of Ohio. The salary was $2,000 per year, and he received an additional $800 per year for the dual role of Indian Affairs Commissioner. Now, this in 2004 dollars because this book was written in like 07 so allowing for you know inflation and everything else was about twenty nine thousand dollars a year so it's, it's not that much to, to be administering such a huge territory uh, especially when you consider that at that time the u.s president was getting twenty five thousand dollars per year so he was basically receiving a pittance i, I mean it's it's on par but still it, it seemed very low to him and he wasn't all dumb i mean he, he certainly seemed to get a lot out of life because of his contacts, but he didn't want to burn any bridges either. So before he accepted the position, he approached Jefferson and said, hey, if you win the election, am I still gonna have a job as the governor or are you gonna replace me? He didn't want to move his wife, child, pregnant wife, you know, she was pregnant again. She basically had kids every two years. He didn't want to move them to the back end of Indiana in the middle of nowhere and then find out he wouldn't have a job a year later. So he got confirmation from Jefferson that his, the position would still be his and he moved his family to Indiana, to Vincennes, Indiana, is where they set up base. Now, Indian Affairs Commissioner, this is basically the, the minister plenipotentiary to the tribes, meaning he was essentially our ambassador, okay? He was acting on the full faith of the sitting president and the secretary of state to act as ambassador to the tribes to negotiate treaties and enforce those treaties. And it kind of seems like in his own paternalistic way he was genuinely concerned for their welfare I mean maybe he was it, it's never wise to judge a man 200 years dead based on the morals of today um, I think he was concerned about the poverty poor health knife fights knife fights and alcohol abuse that he saw and understand and the, do the author does a really good job of this he says there is literally no indication that I mean, I mean I get that this is a stereotype that you know Native Americans are all drunks there's literally no indication that they are more prone to alcohol abuse than anybody else much like white people their alcohol abuse is going to stem from depression and isolation and there was plenty of that going around in the early 19th century so much like 20th century prohibition as Harrison tried to limit the flow of alcohol to the native tribes but didn't work because there was a ready supply available and a lot of demand for it. He, however, did not automatically assume that whites were an innocent party when conflicts arose between settlers and native tribes, and I think he did try to be impartial in meeting out punishment such as it was, but he was also under direct orders from President Jefferson to basically try and trick the tribes out of the land. This wooded area is the site of um, the murder, actually, of Nathaniel Bixby Mark, he was a pioneer who was killed by a tribe of Wamapoke Indians after he traded them a baby for what is now Indianapolis. So this I'm pulling directly from the book. This is a direct quote, and this was a letter written from President Jefferson to Harrison in February of 1803. Quote, our system is to live in perpetual peace with the Indians, to cultivate an affectionate attachment from them by everything just and liberal, which we can do for them within the bounds of reason and by giving them effectual protection against wrongs from our own people. The decrease of game, rendering their subsistence by hunting insufficient. We, well, basically, we're going to outhunt them. We're going to draw them. We wish to draw them into agriculture, spinning and weaving. When they withdraw themselves to the culture of a small piece of land, they will perceive how useless to them their own extensive forests are and will be willing to sell them off to us in exchange for necessaries for their farms and families. Isn't that nice? We're going to convince them that hunting is bad, make them be farmers, and then sell them what they need to make their farm successful. Then, 
continuing the quote, to promote this disposition to, of, to exchange lands which they have to spare and we want, we shall push our trading uses and be glad to see them run in debt because we observe that when these debts get beyond what the individuals can pay, they become willing to lock them off by cession of lands. So force them to sell their forests by out hunting them and then force them to sell their farmlands by running them into debt. That was, that was the official policy and Harrison took that decree and ran with it. I mean, he followed it to the absolute letter. I mean, never mind that the women of the native tribes were already quite accomplished at agriculture. They already knew how to farm. They were quite good at it. We're going to out hunt them and then get them to sell their forest because why would you need forest if you're not hunting? Let them buy on credit to expand their farms because really one bad year is all you need to not be able to pay your debts. And then we can force them to pay, sell their lands to pay those debts. Just pernicious and evil. The author Robert M. Owens does point out this was probably not seen as evil back then, and I believe it because ethnocentrism is pretty standard, right? Most people tend to think that their way is the best, and that's standard across the board. It's not just Americans who think that way. It's that way, you know, the, the Japanese believe the same about China, about Korea. The Mongolians certainly believed it. Although the Mongolians were a little more open-minded and willing to accept that other people might do things better anyways. Um, but with that letter, Harrison was kind of launched on his campaign to extinguish Indian land titles. And he did by forcing one shady land session deal after another on the tribes. And he would invite all the tribes to a council, but only meet with specific tribal elders who are friendly to American interests. He would buy lands from one tribe who didn't have any actual interest or ownership in the lands being sold basically buying them out from underneath the actual owners. But as Robert M. Owens points out, it bears mentioning, and this is a direct quote, bears mentioning that William Henry Harrison, like Thomas Jefferson and other leading American officials, did not hate Indians per se. They were certainly ravenous, often patronizing, and even unethical when it came to buying up Indian lands. Unlike their view of blacks, though, they did not draw the strictest racial lines with Indians. Basically, as long as the tribe in question was compliant, there were no problems. Compliant, right? Now, in addition to his responsibilities as the Indian Affairs Commissioner, Harrison's job as governor of the territory included moving the territory forwards towards statehood. So he kind of rushed through some of those early votes, which allowed him to maintain kind of a stranglehold on power, essentially assuring himself a rubber stamp government that would green light whatever he sought to do. And by no means did everybody in the territory agree with his policies not with how he was managing the land sessions with the Indians and certainly not how he handled the slave question. Now, as part of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, slavery was not supposed to be legal in the Northwest Territories, any of them, um, including the territory of Indiana, obviously. But Harrison, as a son of a Virginia planter and part of being a land-owning gentleman meant the right to own slaves, because of course. So Harrison swung an end, round around, end run around the ordinance by allowing indentured servants. Now, technically, indentured servitude is for a limited period of time. That's how quite a few of the Irish came over, is they would sign on as an indentured servant, come over to the States, serve there five or seven years, however long their indenture was. And it was typically between five and seven years, and then, boom, they were free to go about their lives. So when he introduced his law to introduce, you know, black persons into Indiana. I think actually that might have been what it was called. When a person moved to Indiana territory with slaves, they had 30 days to register those slaves as indentured servants. Sounds like a good thing, right? Five to seven years. Sounds like there's an end in sight. I mean, at least as the indentured servant, they are going to have a chance at freedom. But whereas a Irishman coming over from Ireland, might sign on for an indenture of five to seven years. The indenture for these slaves could be anywhere from 15 to 99 years. Nice, right? And if the former slave rejected the term of indenture, then the owner had 60 days to either emancipate them or sell them back south. So guess, uh, guess how many chose emancipation? That was a pretty solid zero. Now during this, same period of time that this rule is being established, so we're looking in like 1806 approximately, the brother of the Shawnee warrior Tecumseh has a vision. Now at the time that his name was 
I'm so sorry, I'm going to mispronounce this, Lalawathika, he had been basically a loser by like any metric, all right, the, the native, the Shawnee would have believed so, the Americans certainly believe so, he was an alcoholic, he had no skills, he was not a warrior, he only had one eye. Um, in April of 1805, he fell over by a fire, basically having a fit. His family thought he might be dying or dead. And because he was good for nothing, they were like, well, I mean, if he dies, he dies. So when he came out of his trance, he uh, announced that he was La Lala Wathika no more. Now he was Tenskwatawa, he who opens the door. And he came to be called the prophet. He had nothing but anger and rejection towards Americans and the way of life they were expounding on. And understand, this was not a rejection of white man. He had no complaints with the British, the French, or the Spanish because they had all treated more or less fairly with the Shawnee and the other native tribes. It was specifically American underhandedness that he was rejecting. He stopped drinking and he took up the mantle of profit for his people. Shortly after this, Several of the tribes underwent a series of witch hunts, and I mean literal witch hunts. They were accusing members of the tribes of being witches, and they were executing them, burning them at the stake, no less. And Harrison shrewdly noted that those accused of witchcraft were those who were friendly towards American goals. And he also identified Tensk Watawa as being the source of the witch hunts. And so in April of 1806, he challenged Tensk Watawa, said, hey, you are truly a prophet, why don't you just cause the sun to stand still, or the rivers to alter their course, I mean, just make the dead rise in their graves, do something to prove that you're this great holy man. And he published his challenge in a newspaper on April 12, 1806. I think he was trying to get a laugh in with his buddies over, look at the stupid you know, Indian who thinks he's a prophet. And apparently he did not think Tenskwatawa could read, and he also did not think Tenskwatawa was aware of astronomy. Unfortunately for Harrison, he was wrong on both counts. And on June 16, 1806, Tenskwatawa told the Shawnee that he would bring about a black sun. And he made this announcement right before a complete solar eclipse started. And then he announced that he would bring the sun back right as the eclipse was ending, which was kind of a neat historical reversal given that Columbus used a similar trick in Jamaica 300 years earlier. So. Harrison was hoisted by his own petard. It was, I kind of do wish I could have been like a little fly on the wall right then to be like, well, you just eat that pie of crow, you jackass. You just kind of earned it. The prophet's status as a man to be believed was assured and Harrison was left just egg all over his face. And at this moment in history, Aaron Burr rides in with his abortive attempt at a national coup. Now, I didn't, Books that I read on both Thomas Jefferson and James Madison discussed this. I didn't go into it in those reviews um, because, frankly, it happened so far west, right? I mean, it was certainly relevant. It was definitely an issue, but it wasn't anything. It, it was more of an aside for me, I guess. But here it becomes really relevant because Burr was writing right through Indiana and used his connection to Wilkinson as an, as an introduction to Harrison. So Aaron Burr, really quick history lesson here, was Thomas Jefferson's vice president from 1801 to 1805. The election in 1800 that put Jefferson in the White House was too close to call and went before the legislature. Now Adams at that time was a very distant third, so he was not in the running. It was literally the, the legislature was going to choose, was it Jefferson for president and Burr for vice president or the other way around, Burr for president, Jefferson for vice president. And at the time, Jefferson basically bluffed Congress into making him president and Burr became a very resentful vice president. And when the 1804 election rolled around, he was not even considered to run as vice president because at that time he had had his infamous duel with Alexander Hamilton, which precluded him from being elected for that second term. And so Burr struck out on his own. And that's all relevant because, like I said, Burr used his connection to Brigadier General James Wilkinson as an introduction to Harrison and basically tried to bribe Harrison into allowing him to use Indiana as a jumping off point. Now, he didn't quite say that in so many words and because Harrison never would have gone for it, right? He was the son of one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He 
believed himself to be a true blue patriot and he would never ever have agreed to overthrowing the sitting system of government and I mean he wanted Indiana to become a state of the United States he didn't want to you know reign in hell he was happy to serve in heaven basically so Burr I mean for whatever reason whether Harrison just didn't like him or if he sensed something was going on for whatever reason Harrison stayed out of it and Wilkinson was kind of this ever wily reader of the winds he realized that Burr was heading for catastrophe and sold him out to Congress and the president said hey Burr's up to no good out here he's trying to make the Indiana territories and the Louisiana purchase their own country independent of the United States he's inciting rebellion he's he's up to no good so Burr was tried for treason and found not guilty however one of Harrison's buddies Davis Floyd was embroiled in Burr's plots and he was arrested as well and tried for treason and he well he was tried I don't think he was tried for treason he was tried he was found guilty but his sentence was to serve three hours in jail and pay a ten dollar fine seems very light but since Burr was found not guilty of all charges by a sympathetic judge back in Washington I mean really that that was that's where it was now at the same time the pro and anti-slavery debate in the territory is heating up and this was kind of interesting because this is I, this is why I read I didn't know this in school like what was taught to me in school was that there was the pro-slavery party and there were the abolitionists and those were the two parties right um, those were the battle lines that were drawn and that's what existed now in this book I learned there was historically a third demographic which played a heavy part in the Northwest Territory they disliked slavery not because they were against slavery as an institution but because they were just flat-out racist and didn't want black people in the Indiana Territory and so they were anti-slavery not because they wanted freedom for everybody they just were screaming racist and didn't want black people there so isn't that nice kind of also calls to question one of the some of the things I read in um, American nations few beginning of the year I guess now basically the eastern districts of Indiana and Ohio were anti-slavery while the Illinois district was pro-slavery Harrison while he was I mean he was undoubtedly up to dirty dealings with the Native Americans he was an absolute shit when it came to, to you know black rights but I think he did try to protect them from some of the more blatantly racist aspects of living with American settlers um, and I mean the author Robert M. Owens find, found many instances historically where Native American is injured killed or robbed by settlers and Harrison goes above and beyond what might have been expected of him to try and find justice and that's that's commendable it is um, and, and but it, and, and he's written he wrote it that way I think to support his basic premise which is not that Harrison was inherently racist but that he was very much a product of his time which we all are so that's a fair conclusion to draw and that product of his time meant he had this heavy paternalistic attitude that favored white settlers because that was the product of his time ultimately the Illinoisans were granted their request and they broke off into their own territory in 1809 Illinois is granted its wish and well because Indiana did not yet have its own required population of 60,000 men to be considered statehood so he Harrison remained the governor of Indiana Illinois became its own territorial province it wasn't a state they, they weren't accepted as statehood yet either but they did get their own governor and by 1810 the Indiana Territory had been settled into its current geographic layout so Ohio at that point had become its own state Illinois had broken off and now we have Indiana still a territory but its state lines are now drawn and just as he had lost on the slavery question you know because now the people of Indiana are anti-slavery because they're they don't want black people there um, the people began to a concentrated campaign to overturn that end run around slavery and deliberately overturned his ordinance to allow the transition of slaves to indentured servants now and that's not to say that all the people of Indiana were racist um, and just didn't want black people in but enough of them were to make an impact on history and so that tells a story too that has also been hidden it's a lot you can learn from reading and he continued to do his job as the minister plenipotentiary to the tribes he brought multiple more land session deals before the tribes using his tried and true divide and conquer strategy some of them were successful 
but one of the points that the author drives home repeatedly throughout the book uh, is that so much of what ailed the United States during Western expansion was their own heavy-handed policies with the native tribes. And Americans at that time tended to blame the British, French, and Spanish. You know, oh, if only they would stay away from, I and mean, think about it, that kind of fed the Monroe Doctrine, right? They'll just stay out of here. We can get along with these tribes just fine. And they never once reflected on their own dirty dealings with the tribes as a possible source of their tribulations. Another quote from the book, part of the motivation for securing Indian lands was to force Indians to relinquish their independence and accept American sovereignty, thereby reducing British influence. In so doing, Harrison and the Americans felt they were safeguarding peace. Instead, rapid land acquisition acquisitions made the old British Indian alliance viable once more. That's true, right? And the Indians are, they weren't stupid, my God. They looked at this and went, yeah, we're getting totally screwed by these people and the British always were fair with us, so let's go treat with them again. Don't blame them. You know, if you're going to be a bastard, expect it to stab you in the back. Now, at the same time that he's, Harrison is dealing with the overturning of the laws he enacted for his own convenience, meaning those slave to indentured servant laws, he starts actively dealing with Tecumseh. Tecumseh, I had vaguely heard the name before. He is not somebody who is taught, I'm excuse me, he was not taught a great deal when I was in school. I had heard the name briefly mentioned. I had heard it more in relation to William Tecumseh Sherman, the Civil War general. And so now I'm like, well, now I need to read more about Tecumseh because I think he is also fascinating. Um, Tecumseh was well-educated. He was a brilliant orator, um, much better than William Henry Harrison. And the author somewhere in here says that Harrison never won a fair fight. Like never, not on the battlefield, not in the debate. If it was a fair fight, he wasn't going to win it. And he, he genuinely relied on patronage to make his way in the world. So he had to fight dirty. Um, this is 1810, approximately. Things are slowly starting to heat up with Britain. They, they do eventually culminate in the War of 1812. And finally, Tecumseh calls bullshit. They had a meeting at Harrison's home of Grouseland in 1810, which very nearly came to blows. But Harrison backed down because he couldn't win at a fair fight. And the talks resumed with nothing actually being resolved. Now, before he left the meeting, Tecumseh advised Harrison that Tecumseh was leaving for another meeting with some other tribes, and he asked Harrison not to do anything until he returned. Now, I can think of two reasons why he made that request of Harrison. Uh, one, and this is a noble reason, is his, he saw something honorable in Harrison and thought they could treat justly with each other. The other is that he was testing Harrison's honor. And if that was the case, Harrison failed, bleakly failed. Because as soon as Tecumseh left Indiana Terrison, Harrison calls up the militia, borrowing friends from Kentucky and Ohio to fill out their ranks, and rode on Tecumseh, Tecumseh's home camp of, at Prophetstown, located on the shores of the Tippecanoe River. So that's where that Tippecanoe comes from. And that is where Tecumseh's brother, the prophet Tenskwatawa, was living with the members of Tecumseh's group of Shawnee. And there can be no question about Harrison's intent being peaceful. I mean, he came out with weapons and was ready to ready to take on the tribe. However, whether through hubris or his own poor supply, Harrison failed to set up proper defenses when making camp, and Tenskwatawa took a group of warriors and attacked Harrison, kind of beat him to the punch. And while both sides suffered losses, and Harrison eventually claimed it as a victory, in reality, the Shawnee lost about 50, and Harrison lost 188. And only political spin doctoring kept Harrison from losing everything. And the eventual outbreak of official war with Britain made it retrospectively seem like a preemptive strike. So timing worked in his favor. When war was declared, Harrison pulled his family back from the frontier to Ohio and resigned as the governor of Indiana, instead taking up the position of major general with the army. And after a series of lackluster battles, because the War of 1812, America did not do well in. I mean, it, we just didn't. We sucked. Uh, Harrison was basically outmaneuvered by the Secretary of War, John Armstrong. He tendered his resignation to President Madison, expecting Madison to say, oh, no, I can't accept this. You must keep going. When war was declared, Armstrong, being the Secretary of War, got the resignation while Madison was at home, basically, for summer break and said, okay, your resignation is accepted. 
bon voyage. <laughs> and um, Harris was like, oh, okay. And he effectively retired from public life at that time. I mean, he, he very briefly for about a year resumed his job as Indian Affairs Plenipotentiary, affecting a few more land deals, and then he retired from that position. He did serve as senator from Ohio before serving as minister to Columbia. Then in 1840, he was chosen to run against Martin Van Buren for the presidency. That was his, uh, him and his running mate, John Tyler. So he ran as the log cabin candidate and the political theater took on kind of a whole new meaning during his campaign with his campaign party literally assembling log cabins wherever he was giving speeches. I mean, he was billed as a humble man of a people. I mean, this man who built an enormous estate in Indiana trying to recapture that grand estate from Virginia, a man who was perpetually in debt himself as he tried to grab a hold of a gentleman's status to which he had been born, but did not have the money to support that lifestyle. They tried to show that he was just like the average working man and he drank hard cider, hence my choice of hard cider for the eggnog today, and he won. I mean, he won mostly because of Van Buren's own failed campaign strategy and the financial panic that consumed Van Buren's term as president from 37 to 41. Harrison won. And then he delivered a two-hour-long inauguration speech during the pouring rain, contracting pneumonia, and died 31 days after taking office, becoming the first president to die in office, thus providing another hallmark test of the Constitution. The first was... Actually, not when Washington stepped down, because Washington had decided not to run again. But it was when Adams stepped down, because Adams lost the race. And the question was, will he actually peacefully turn over power to Jefferson, or is he going to try and make a coup? So the first test was that Adams-Jefferson race, where Adams passed over the, the, the power and retired. And now we had to see how the country was going to do when a man not directly elected had taken over the presidency. And that would be President John Tyler. He's next month. I mean, I would like to say that Harrison was now number one in my personal rankings because, I mean, really, he died 30 days into office. He wasn't in power long enough to screw it up. And, I mean, but after reading this book, I kind of got to wonder if um, God was like, you don't want this one. You don't want this one. We're going we're gonna to take him out of the equation. You don't want this one. Um. Because, frankly, his history of double dealing with the Native Americans makes it impossible to rank him that high. And I think the author does a respectable job explaining the thought processes that were in operation 200 years ago and why Tippecanoe and Tyler II won the race in 1840. And the planner class from Virginia, of which Harrison was most definitely one of them, believed in government at its most paternal and patronizing. They believed it was their responsibility to take care of everyone around them, including Native Americans. Unfortunately, the concept of he who governs best governs least did not take hold, and so their idea of taking care of the natives were to make the tribes wholly dependent on the government, buying the land for less than its value, way less than its value. And that was one of the points that Tecumseh raised to Harrison. I mean, Tecumseh knew the government was basically stealing the land. Under Harrison's, under Harrison's land session deals, the U.S. government bought up some 50 million acres from the native tribes for less than two cents per acre. And then they turned around and sold that same land to settlers for two dollars per acre. Tecumseh just wanted the going rate. He wanted that two dollars per acre for his people. And he wanted the right to survey the land and make sure that they were selling land that they weren't going to be using. And Harrison just kept pushing through, pushing through. Well, you know, if you do that, then we're not going to pay you X amount. We're going to pay you even less than that. You know, this way you're ensuring you're getting rid of bad land as well as good land. And he tried to basically force through this idea that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And that's not always the case. And this kind of early decade of dirty dealing set us up for a century plus of hostile relations with native tribes all across the country. Because seriously why would they think that the tribes aren't talking to each other? That the tribes further west aren't aware of how badly we are screwing the people on this side of the country. So I think I'm going to place Harrison at number eight. Just above Jackson, but below Van Buren. And it was kind of a tough one. But I think 
even if Van Buren hadn't happened, we'd still be stuck with kind of this modern day clusterfuck of American politics. Because all of the books I've read, every single one of them has shown that partisanship has always been there. But Harrison, I mean, as underhanded as his dealing were, dealings were, I think he was shooting for paternalism and Jackson was just openly hostile towards others. So I'm keeping him at dead last, for now at least. And that's it for this week. Thank you for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments. I will see you all next week. Bye. They cut his face off. And they made it into a dream catcher. And they made his legs into rain sticks. And that's the great thing about Indians back then is they used every part of the pioneer.